Thanks to Hover for keeping Legal Eagle in the air. Get 10% off your first domain using the link in the description. Warning, video contains graphic images of fake blood, real insects, and terrifying lawyering. Viewer discretion is advised. You don't need to read it, just sign it. It says I can physically abuse you. What? I am here to hurt you! They can't do it, they can't do it, they can't do it! I can't do it! That's not good. I want to do it! Help! Hmm. Happy Halloween, Legal Eagles! Today we're taking a look at one of America's most notorious scary attractions. This is a haunt where visitors may have their heads forcibly shaved, be submerged in a tank full of water, or wind up strapped down while bugs crawl into their mouths. It's a haunt so terrifying, so spine-tingling, and so bloody that it inspired a change.org petition asking for it to be outlawed. Yes, I'm talking about the internet's favorite McCamey Manor, the controversial fright attraction where you have to sign a very, very long waiver while wearing an adult onesie, just to get the chance to suffer through a multi-day experience that could end with you winning $20,000. Do not come here. And I can't tell you how many times people have emailed me asking, is it real and is it legal? The attraction's founder, Russ McCamey, has created a house of horrors that has bedeviled the haunts community. Is McCamey for real? Does he really get people to legally consent to being tortured? Or is he just an amazing showman who creates videos that make it look like he runs some kind of summer camp for sadists? Let's take a break from the horrors of the political world to discuss the real horror show and its legality in McCamey Manor. So what is the McCamey Manor experience? You could say that McCamey Manor is similar to the thousands of other frightening attractions that have operated during the Halloween season, but you'd be wrong. McCamey Manor is not a haunted house. They claim it's an experience that lasts anywhere from four hours to three days where participants are exposed to extreme physical and mental assaults in secret locations. If this sounds like your kind of thing, well, you can't just buy a ticket. Russ McCamey says that there's a waiting list of more than 20,000 people who are begging to be at his mercy. Mercy. What happens during your stay at McCamey Manor? Well, you'll be exposed to extreme acts like being kidnapped and then forced through a series of physical challenges. People have been put in a straitjacket and dunked in a tank of eels and force fed while tied up. Participants may find themselves strapped to a bed where snakes crawl over their bodies. McCamey Manor's YouTube channel is full of clips and photos of people shivering in fear and covered in dirt and fake blood. Well, at least we hope it's fake. McCamey films all of this and retains the footage and unlike other haunt experiences where participants use skill and acting to scare you without touching you, McCamey Manor employees go out of their way to touch you. Of course, the McCamey website hasn't been updated for the COVID-19 era, so actually any kind of physical touching seems kind of nice at this point. Mmm. Oh. But until recently, McCamey Manor didn't even use a safe word to make the experience stop, and the waiver explicitly says you aren't allowed to fight back. So when does it end? Well, when Russ McCamey decides that you are mentally or physically broken. So, legally, are you just, are you saying that's it? You quit? Yeah. Is that cool? I mean, I don't want to disappoint, but yeah. This year, the attraction begins in Somerton, Alabama, which is 45 minutes over the Alabama line. And if you make it through your experience, which is hosted by a terrifying woman who will sap you of your will to live, then you're officially taken to Nashville to an attraction called Catus Silvis, which is Latin for murder in the woods. But McCamey says no one has made it past murder in the woods yet. McCamey's Somerton neighbors are alarmed. They've reported hearing chainsaws and screams coming from the barn all night long. One neighbor said they had a girl pulling out down one of the driveways over there. They had a girl by the neck pulling her with a chain. McCamey said, this was just an actor filming a bit for him. McCamey insists that his attractions are a labor of love and he just loves a good scare. He claims that during the entry interview, he learns about people's fears and then designs the experience to create psychological terror. If you buy the hype behind the waiver and all the videos McCamey has posted to his YouTube channel, then it looks as if McCamey isn't trying to scare people, he's trying to torture them. And the scenes look straight out of horror movies like Hostel. I just wanna go home with my grandma and my daughter, my husband, please. So the question is, how can this be legal? Well, we start with the extremely long waiver that participants are forced to sign. According to news reports, neighbors have called the police when they hear or see something scary at the McCamey place. But police don't file charges because the participants signed a waiver. A waiver, as you probably know, is an agreement that offers a business two protections. First, the waiver relieves one party of any blame or liability arising from negligence or wrongdoing regarding the particular activity, such as running through a bonkers haunted house. Second, one party, usually the one that drafted the agreement, 
is freed from all liability arising out of the performance of that contract. Now, if you've ever interacted in the real world, you know that you can find liability waivers and disclaimers almost anywhere, like a dry cleaner receipt prohibiting the dry cleaner from liability for damage to the clothing, or a normal amusement park that doesn't torture its patrons. You can find a waiver on the ticket, or signs such as swim at your own risk or park at your own risk. From a public policy perspective, it's considered positive to let private parties regulate their own affairs and allocate risk. However, the law also won't let parties be completely reckless, especially when there's unequal bargaining power. Since courts have to balance all these factors, anyone running a recreational or event-based business needs a waiver that satisfies specific conditions. So let's talk about some of those conditions, which includes that a waiver must be voluntary. A waiver is a contract or an addendum to a contract, and for that contract to be valid, the parties have to demonstrate that they voluntarily entered into it. This means that the person entered into it freely without coercion or interference and that the person had the knowledge and capacity to act. Now, there's no evidence that McKamey lets minors or people with diminished capacity go through the manner. But the bigger question is whether people are voluntarily signing that waiver. In Snecloth versus Bustamante, the Supreme Court stated that a waiver is not valid if, quote, coerced by explicit or implicit means, by implied threat or covert force. And before McKamey will agree to take someone through this creation, they have to sit down with him and discuss what may happen during the experience. Participants are asked to sign a 30 to 40 page waiver limiting McKamey's liability for anything that happens. They watch a two hour video showing what other people experienced at McKamey Manor. And participants must produce notes from a doctor proving that they are in great physical and mental health. You get your middle medical letter saying you're okay? Yep. All right, make sure you bring that. There will be a drug test and participants have to prove that they have health insurance. And McKamey also insists that participants bring a friend. So together you and a friend will wear adult onesies while McKamey explains how he intends to drown you and rough you up while begging you not to go through with it. You really don't want to do this. So are people who enter McKamey Manor signing their waiver freely without interference? Well, McKamey stresses his rigorous screening process, but his promotional videos show us something else, that people are allegedly tortured while they sign the paperwork. We're gonna sign some paperwork now. I'm gonna give you some waivers, all of you. And many people on the internet claim that the participants are kidnapped and tortured before they ever sign a waiver. So how do we prove that this is true though? Well, as far as I can tell, he hasn't been sued by anyone claiming this. And frankly, in America, the fact that you haven't been sued over something is not bad evidence that you actually didn't engage in the actual act itself. But the videos McKamey Manor uploads to the YouTube channel purport to show that people are being slapped around and forced to sign paperwork. But there's also what happens to be some skillful sleight of hand here. The video purports to show a woman named Beth going over some paperwork while bloodied, bruised, and restrained. When you're screaming for mercy and crying and you want out, do you want me to let you go? No, sir. Say it louder. No, sir. But if you look closely, you can see that the actor put fake blood capsules in her mouth and then she spits out the fake blood. This of course looks atrocious and terrible, but in this video, you'll see that people are being asked to sign waivers in the middle of the experience. Read 20 together, go. Participants, participants fully understand, understand and agree that, that no one's participants participant If it happened before the experience, this could be coercion. Don't get the papers wet, gentlemen. They need to sign. The video is edited to show participants, including Beth being slapped around while they look at the waiver, but then the video cuts to a time when Beth is agreeing on camera that she has read and agreed to the waiver. Did you freely sign the waiver and did you really understand what you're reading and did we read it out loud like little three-year-olds and go <laughs> through it page by page? Yes, we did. It was a process, but we did it. Here, McKamey tells her that she won't be injured or killed, but may end up with bumps and bruises and even a broken bone. You know that no one's gonna kill you. You know yeah. that you're not gonna get injured, but you also know that you're very likely, in fact, I can guarantee you that you're going to get bumps and bruises and sprains, maybe even a broken bone. Russ should probably know that bumps and bruises and broken bones are in fact injuries, but we'll leave that aside for the moment. There's some bruises, sports some fans. Ones, yeah. There's that, that's what you get. <laughs> Man, it looks good. And yet Beth agrees on camera before she even starts the event. We never had a broken bone, but maybe you're the first, right? Maybe I'll be the record breaker. There you are, maybe the record, the actual real breaker. 
did she sign the waiver then too? McKamey implies that she did. We know he has a video of him reading the various parts of this waiver. And it's also possible that these are just actors <laughs> and it's just really, really good marketing. But later in the same video, McKamey interviews Beth after the events depicted in the video, asking, did we ever force you? To which she replies, absolutely not. And you know that it's physical beforehand. You know all these things, right? So do we keep any secrets from you absolutely. without telling you? But is this truly a situation where Beth feels that she has no choice but to sign the contract? Is she being compelled by force and then the threat of force? We don't really know for sure because the video cuts to a clip of Beth before she enters the event where she's pretty obviously capable of signing the waiver. And here's Beth later saying that yes, she went through page by page. It was a process, but we did it. According to Beth, she signed the paperwork before the experience and acquiesced to it ahead of time. And obviously if people didn't sign the waiver ahead of time and aren't informed about what's about to happen, then yes, McKamey might have all sorts of liability. So if McKamey beat them or held them at gunpoint or used some sort of economic coercion against them when they signed the waiver, then I'm confident the waiver would probably be invalid. But you can look at this specific video and conclude that the actors probably make the participants go through the whole waiver process again during the experience for the show of it as part of the psychological game that they play, or they were just making the actors sign fake waivers. But let's talk about another one of the requirements for this crazy waiver to be valid, which is that a waiver must be specific about known and unknown risks. All states have their own requirements when it comes to these sort of things, but whether a waiver will be enforceable generally boils down to whether the injury arises from risks stated in the waiver. This means that the language of the waiver should be specific about both known and unknown risks and the inherent risks of an activity. Starting with paragraph 17, the McKamey Manor waiver starts listing all of the things that could happen to someone who participates in McKamey Manor. There could be bumps, bruises, cuts, and other possible injuries, including broken bones. Paragraph 18 asks that you not fight with the actors, while 19 warns that, with respect to doing the entire experience, you really don't want to do this, in all caps. Paragraph 24 says that you understand you aren't being held against your will, and McKamey Manor is well aware that the neighbors may misconstrue what's going on and call the police. That's why paragraph 3 says the participant agrees that if the police are called or appear on the scene, that participant acknowledges that this is just a game. This idea that this is just a game is a common theme in this crazy contract. What else is in this contract? Forcibly shaved head and eyebrows. There's a paragraph for that. Stuffed inside a 55 gallon drum and rolled down a hill onto a pond count on it. Buried in a pit with hundreds of mice, rats, and rodents. Your responsibility to fight through it. Knives in close contact with your body, even your neck? Definitely possible. Hypothermia? Sure. Why not? Hundreds of welts from a paintball gun? Obviously. Now, in a stroke of genius, some of these scenarios are probably just there to get inside your head to play on your worst fears, like Russ McKamey promises. This would be the bits about being buried alive, submerged in 60 feet of water without a breathing apparatus, walking a plank 25 feet off the ground without a safety net, encountering poisonous animals or possible electrocution. This all sounds ridiculous, but McKamey claims that he's never been sued, but he also claims that he has been sued and that all lawsuits have been thrown out once he reveals the videos of what happened. So we're dealing with some inconsistent information. But is this waiver good in a court of law? Well, that requires digging into something called a pre-injury release waiver. McKamey Manor's waiver is such a pre-injury release. This is a written document that a participant signs before engaging in a recreational activity. The document is a contract which releases the service provider from claims an individual may bring as a result of the provider's negligence. You typically sign a pre-injury release for skydiving, bungee jumping, and trampoline parks. This release of future liability is a contractual agreement where one party surrenders legal rights or obligations. Though generally, a valid release continues to be a complete bar to recovery in negligence actions in almost every jurisdiction. But what courts consider to be a valid release varies from state to state. Here's an example of the most recent McKamey Manor waiver. It's from 2017, the jurisdiction is California. So for purposes of this video, I'll discuss California, Tennessee, and Alabama law together, since pre-injury releases are valid and enforceable in all three states under generally similar circumstances. Though generally a waiver is unenforceable, if there's fraud or willful injury. Now, you might be thinking, but isn't that exactly what McKamey Manor is doing, intentionally causing injury? Well, not so fast, because the contractual language goes into explicit detail about the harm that may befall you, but always with a caveat that this is the type of harm that would be an accident and is no way intentional or, most importantly, willful. The waiver requires participants to agree that their lives are not in danger and it's just a game. Participants are supposed to realize that they aren't really being tortured, even if it feels like they 
are. It says that you'll be roughed up, but no one is there to actually hurt you. This is McCamey's way of saying that an injury is accidental and not willful. But then there's the issue of negligence and whether you can waive a negligence claim. The legal system defines negligence as the failure to exercise the care towards others, which a reasonable or prudent person would do in the same or similar circumstances. And to prove negligence, lawyers have to show that a person being sued had a duty of care to another person, that they breached that duty, and that the breach caused the plaintiff's injuries. By waiving negligence claims, people who participate in McCamey Manor are giving up their right to sue if McCamey acts unreasonably. But can someone simply waive claims of ordinary negligence? Well, yes, almost always you can. Unless the process of getting the waiver signed was somehow fraudulent or the person who signed the release was a minor, the parties can waive their right to sue for negligence. As long as the waiver accurately expresses the intent of the parties and the injury is reasonably included in the type of thing that the waiver was intended to cover, that negligence waiver will probably be upheld. People who've tried to sue haunted attractions for negligence have been kicked out of court because they waived their negligence claims. For example, in 2011, Scott Griffin and friends went to the Haunted Trail in San Diego. The Haunted Trail was a mile long path where visitors were chased by actors dressed in scary costumes carrying fake weapons. And and the tickets that they purchased had a warning that said the trail included, quote, high impact scares. Griffin and his friends made it through the trail with no problems, but as they walked out to the exit, an actor carrying a revving chainsaw rushed towards them. Griffin made what some would call a rookie mistake, thinking that the attraction was over before he was back in his car. He panicked and fell, injuring both wrists, which were in cast for four months. The court dismissed the negligence lawsuit because of the ticket disclaimer, quote, being chased within the physical confines of the haunted trail by a chainsaw carrying maniac is a fundamental part and inherent risk of this amusement. Griffin voluntarily paid money to experience it. As the Griffin case demonstrates, a plaintiff goes through a Halloween attraction for the purpose of being scared. You scared me, dog. That's the point, isn't it? It, it is, it is, and you're doing well. As long as the person is sufficiently warned about the potential hazards prior to entering a certain space, courts probably won't hold the business liable for injuries caused by mistakes the business makes, or the injuries that might result from fear-based reactions. And for an example, of basic negligence, consider the case of Mays versus Gretna Athletic Boosters. There, a Louisiana business got sued for using a lot of black visqueen material inside of the haunted house. A 10-year-old girl got frightened and ran straight into a cinder block wall, breaking her nose. Now, even if the business arguably made the haunted house too dark, so dark that she couldn't tell it was a cinder block wall, the negligence waiver was upheld. That's because the business didn't intend for this to happen. It may have made a mistake, but generally the building's construction was sound. Haunted house operators are duty bound to protect patrons only from unreasonably dangerous conditions and probably not from every conceivable danger. Another example of a fear-based reaction happened in Louisiana where the plaintiff broke her leg in a corn maze while running from an actor dressed as Jason from Friday the 13th. The court ruled that she was explicitly warned that she might be chased by scary looking actors. Quote, we find that no duty was owed by the Billingses to Mrs. Dermond, in this case to warn or protect her from her reaction to being frightened by Jason, an experience she expected to have and for which she paid an additional admission fee. But there is an exception to this rule and that's for gross negligence and recklessness. Such a contractual waiver won't protect McCamey Manor if it's guilty of what's called gross negligence. What is gross negligence and how is it different from regular negligence? Well, gross negligence generally involves a higher degree of bad conduct and callous indifference to consequences. In Tennessee, where McCamey now lives, the law doesn't let people contract away liability for gross negligence. However, it's often hard to prove that someone committed committed gross negligence. You'd have to prove one, that the person committed ordinary negligence, and two, the person acted with utter unconcern for the safety of others or with such a reckless disregard for the rights of others that conscious indifference to the consequences is implied. A good example of gross negligence occurred in Kentucky where Glenda Dixon broke her back in four places after falling out of a second story window in a haunted house. Dixon signed a waiver and knew that the house would be scary. However, when she was near a second story open window, one of the actors ran behind Dixon and her group screaming, causing everyone to jump in terror. Dixon jumped backwards and fell out of the open window. The window was covered by a sheet and Dixon had no idea it was actually open. In this case, there was ordinary negligence. An actor scaring a person near an open window causes reckless disregard for what may happen to others as a result of
of the negligence. And a reasonable haunted house would have shut the window that was covered with a sheet before scaring someone who stood near it to prevent defenestrations. So even though some people are horrified by the footage of McKamey Manor, it'd be hard to argue that McKamey was being misleading or failing to warn them about the hazards that they might face. Now, there's one final question about McKamey Manor, and it's probably the question you've had throughout this entire video, which is, can a person actually consent to legitimately harmful acts being perpetrated against them? And a person on Cora asked whether it was legal for McKamey Manor to kill a person? And the answer to that is no. If someone died during the experience, then it would be possible that their family would have a valid legal claim against McKamey Manor for wrongful death, even if they signed the waiver without coercion. Unless the death resulted from very ordinary negligence. Let's say someone died from hypothermia. The waiver warns that hypothermia is a risk, but it also says if hypothermia is detected, the person will be pulled out immediately. If McKamey Manor failed to detect it and someone died, their estate might be able to sue for gross negligence. And not all deaths would lead to a claim. If someone signed the waiver and produced documents saying that they were in good health and they actually had a heart problem and that person had a heart attack, McKamey Manor wouldn't necessarily be liable. It depends heavily on the facts. They are just asking to have someone die or have a heart attack. What happens if someone dies during their tour? A waiver won't mean anything. We have had one heart attack, for real. Seven years ago, we had a heart attack. That was good stuff. And the most common question people have about McKamey Manor is whether it's legal for someone to consent to being hurt, maimed, or even killed at a fright attraction. And unsurprisingly, the answer is both no and yes. In most jurisdictions, consent is a defense to crimes that don't result in serious injury or happen during sporting events. So if we're talking about serious injury, no, McKamey Manor can't intentionally kill someone or cause them egregious bodily harm, even if they sign the waiver. It isn't legal for McKamey Manor to let participants drown or freeze to death, no matter what the waiver says. That's against public policy. So now you know the general rule, consent cannot be given to a serious, harmful criminal act. But as with most things in the law, there are some exceptions. A person generally is allowed to consent to serious harm if the harm is for the purposes of medical treatment, like amputating a leg. They can also consent to being punched or kicked or even attacked as long as they are in a legally sanctioned event, such as boxing or mixed martial arts. And this is legal even though these events could result in serious harm or even death. Boxers have been killed in the ring, but the participants and the promoters generally don't have a legal responsibility for murder or manslaughter that might happen in the boxing ring. Boxing is a state regulated activity that's lawful unless the death happens because of something unrelated to the fight, like the roof collapsing in the ring. So for this exception to apply, the issue is whether the event is legally permissible. A person may not consent to a duel, for instance, because dueling has been outlawed. A person cannot legally consent to a street fight or a barroom brawl, even if it involves the same kind of conduct as an MMA match, because it isn't legal to get into a gang fight or a bar fight. But there might be some exceptions to certain kinds of assault and battery. Assault is the crime of putting another person in fear or apprehension of an unlawful contact. Battery is the actual application of that force, a harmful or offensive contact with another person's body. Assault and battery are crimes and torts. Uh, that means a person can be charged with a crime or sued for committing assault or battery and get monetary damages. Participants in an athletic contest are deemed to have consented to certain assaults and batteries when both the injury and the conduct that caused it are reasonably foreseeable hazards of joint participation in an athletic contest. So when is the contest conduct reasonably foreseeable? This isn't always easy to pin down. NHL hockey player Marty McSorley was found guilty of assault with a weapon after he hit Donald Brashear in the head with a hockey stick when Brashear was skating away from him. The court rejected McSorley's defense that NHL players give explicit consent to the risk of on-ice contact and that McSorley's hit was not an assault. Hockey fights are a foreseeable risk, but intentionally striking someone in the head with a hockey stick is considered assault with a deadly weapon, and that's not a foreseeable risk. Still, Still, most jurisdictions have been very hesitant to prosecute players even when their behavior seems to cross a line. In another hockey case, a New York court let a player strike another player in the neck, slamming him into the goalpost even after the whistle was blown. And the court thought that the victim assumed the risk by participating in the hockey event, even though it was a league that didn't allow players to cross-check each other. The court thought that the policy considerations of having, quote, free and fierce competition in athletic events, end quote, would be severely undermined if the usual criminal standards were applied to athletic competition. 
especially ice hockey. So it's possible that a court could accept the analogy and say that if we let consenting adults engage in what would otherwise be criminal behavior in a sporting event, then we should absolutely let them consent to such behavior at a haunted house as well. But the court could also reject that analogy and say that there are pro-social reasons why we want to encourage people participating in sporting events that simply don't exist for something as frivolous as a haunted house. And that all the safeguards that exist in a sporting event, like referees and umpires, and spectators that actually prevent things from going too far don't exist in the case of a haunted house. And it's just too likely that things are going to go off the rails uh, for entertainment purposes. So what's my verdict? Well, arguably the waiver is legal, at least for a lot of the things that it's trying to disclaim and probably so is the attraction, unless there's a lot of unknown information that we don't have. A few caveats though. It's notable that McCamey has stopped the two most legally questionable practices, which is using minors and not having a safe word or phrase. In the past, McCamey used local teenagers as actors and now he hires only adults. If a participant absolutely can't stand it anymore, they can use a safe phrase to stop the experience. At least that's what we think based on the available evidence. The Nashville scene has reported that McCamey now has an arrangement with police he calls when he's about to give a tour. Some people think that none of this is real and that most of the videos on the YouTube channel feature actors, not participants. And having watched a few hours of it, that's totally plausible, though definitely not certain. And frankly, this may all just be a giant ploy for free advertising because I've done an entire friggin' video on this stupid legal contract. And McCamey is a master of illusion in video editing, so nothing is certain here. There are only two ways to get answers. One is either sue him and see what he's got to say in a deposition, or go through the experience myself. And I think I'll pass on both of those options for now. <laughs> But believe it or not, this video was not sponsored by McCamey. I do not recommend that you go to their website, but at least they were smart enough to snag McCameyManor.com because everyone should own their own website. When I need a new domain, I go to Hover at Hover.com. Maybe I should go there and buy up a specialty website like McCameyManorLawyer.com or McCameyClassAction.com and specialize in representing all the people who suffered those cuts, bruises, and other not injuries that they suffered when they went through McCamey Manor. Hover is the best place on the internet to get yourself a domain name in part because they have over 400 domain extensions to choose from, ranging from .com, .io, .me, to .ninja, and .pizza. You can even get crazy things like .democrat or .republican if you wanted to. One of the great things about Hover is that they have lots of domains that you wouldn't normally think about. For example, I got legaleagle.tv. I haven't put up a website yet, but at least it's ready to go when I figure out what I want to do with it. Though, I did set up legaleagleprep.com for helping law students, and I highly recommend that everyone go and get their name .com or the name of their business before it's gone. It's super easy to buy a domain on Hover. There are no annoying upsales, no annoying pop-ups, and if you have an account like I do, you can get another domain in less than 30 seconds, or just check to see if the website of your dreams is available. And once you've got your domain, Hover has tools for easily setting up professional email addresses. Even if you don't set up a website, you can still create a professional email, because you never want to be that lawyer that uses an AOL or Earthlink email address. Don't be like Stephen Biss. And you can use their great connect feature to easily hook up that domain to a website builder like Squarespace, Wix, or Shopify. Of course, the best part is that if you go to hover.com slash legal eagle, which you'll find in the description down below, you'll get 10% off your first domain purchase. Again, just go to hover.com slash legal eagle or click the link in the description to get 10% off your first domain. Plus clicking on that link really helps out this channel. So do you agree with my analysis? Should McCamey Manor be allowed to operate because consenting adults are gonna consent or should it be shut down? Leave your objections in the comments and check out this playlist over here with all of my other legal reactions as well as my analysis of all the crazy things that you'll find on Reddit and the rest of the internet from a legal perspective. So click on this playlist and I'll see you in court.